of the cause of God and truth by Dr. John Gill, part three, chapter two of election and reprobation, narrated by David Clark. Dr. Whitby, in the fourth chapter of his discourse concerning election, proposes arguments against the doctrine of an absolute election to salvation and consequently to the means which shall inevitably and infrastructurally produce it and to confute the doctrine of absolute reprobation. They are as follow. Argument 1. He who would have all men to whom the gospel is vouchsafed sincerely to believe in Christ to come to repentance and yield sincere obedience to his will revealed to them hath not prepared this saving grace only for some few Christians, leaving the rest under a necessity of perishing for the want of it. For to all such persons he hath promised that they shall not perish. Now, that God seriously wills that all to whom the gospel is vouchsafed should repent and believe and yield sincere obedience to his laws is evident from the scriptures frequently and expressly declaring the doing of these things to be the doing the will of God and the neglecting of them to be the neglecting and even rejecting the will of God from God's calling them to faith repentance and obedience from his sending his apostles and messengers to invite them to them and from his compassionate declarations and inquiries concerning them to which I answer 1 that this argument, supposing it never so strong in favour of the persons included in it, namely all to whom the gospel is vouchsafed, is too much limited and restrained to militate against the doctrines of absolute election and reprobation, seeing there have been and are multitudes of men and women to whom the gospel has never been and is not vouchsafed. God formally showed his word to Jacob his statutes and his judgments unto Israel, he hath not dealt so with any nation, and as far as his judgments they have not known them. For many hundreds of years God suffered all other nations to walk in their own ways. The gospel has been taken away from the Jews and carried among the Gentiles, yet in no age has it been vouchsafed to all nations at once much less to all the individuals of mankind in all nations. No, nor to the individuals in the nations where it has been and preached. The greatest part have generally been without it. Now admitting that it is the will of God that all men to whom the gospel is vouchsafed should believe and repent and obey, nay, supposing that they should all of them actually believe, repent and obey, which is more than is in the argument, this would not be sufficient to set aside the doctrines of absolute election and reprobation, since these persons enjoying the gospel, the means of grace, and obtaining grace itself, should rather appear to be owing to an external secret will and purpose in God, or to an absolute decree of election, preparing this grace and providing these means for them, in order to bring them to salvation, whilst others have neither means nor grace being denied them by an act of preterition or reprobation. If anything is done to purpose, it should be proved that God has vouchsafed the gospel to all men, that he has given to all men sufficient means of grace and has put them all into a capacity of obtaining the blessings of grace and glory. 2. This argument proceeds upon God's will of command, which does not thwart his will of purpose. These two wills, though they differ, are not contrary to the purpose of God. The purpose of God is from eternity. His command is in time, and the one is within himself, the other put forth from himself, and the one is always fulfilled, the other seldom. The one cannot be resisted, the other may. The will of command only signifies what is the pleasure of God should be the duty of man, or what he should do but not what he shall do. Now admitting that it is God's will of command, not, not only all to whom the gospel is vouchsafed, but even all mankind should repent and believe and obey, it does not follow that it is the determining will of God to give grace to all men to repent, believe and obey, nor does it contradict such a will of God determining to give grace to some and enabling them to repent, believe and obey 
and to deny it to others. Could it be proved that either God has willed to give this grace to all men, or that there is no such will in God to give it to some and deny it to others, the controversy will be shut up and we should have no more to say. 3. What is said of the illustration and confirmation of these arguments is founded upon passages of scripture which are not to the purpose, some of them being only to the Jews and not to all mankind, nor even to all to whom the gospel is vouchsafed and are neither exhortations to a national repentance and outward reformation of manners, as in Ezekiel 18.30, Acts 3.19, or our compassionate inquiries and vehement desires concerning their civil and temporal welfare, as Deuteronomy 5.29, Psalm 81.13, Isaiah 5.4, Ezekiel 18.31, and 22.24.13, Luke 13.34. Some of them contain exhortations to persons already converted and called by grace, as 2 Corinthians 5.20, Philippians 2.12, 2, 12, 2 Peter 1.10, as has been made evident in the first part of this work, where also the text so much insisted upon, 1 Timothy 2.4, is proved to intend only some and not all individuals of human nature others of whom are expressions, declarations and invitations of grace delivered out in indeterminate terms for the encouragement and relief of sensible sinners to believe in Christ for life and salvation, as John 3.16, Proverbs 9.6, Revelations 12.17, and those which are most for the purpose is 1 John 3.23, Acts 17.30, only declare God's will of command or what he has made man's duty, but not his intentions, purposes, counsels and decrees concerning what man shall do, or he will bestow upon him, and so in no wise contradict the doctrine of absolute election and reprobation. Argument 2. This decree is absolutely false in the foundation of it, that being laid in the sin of Adam, imputing by God's arbitrary will to his posterity to which I reply not to take notice that this argument has not the form and scarce the appearance of one. It is not very easy to determine what decree the author means, whether the decree of election or of reprobation. If the decree of election is intended, the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity is not the foundation of that, either according to the sublapsarian or superlapsarian scheme. The sublapsarian scheme supposes the objects of election to be men considered as fallen, but the supralapsarians suppose them considered as unfallen, not yet made in the pure mass of creatorship. Yet both with the scriptures make the foundation of this decree to be the sovereign will and pleasure of God. If the decree of reprobation is designed, this, according to the sublapsarians, finds and leaves men sinners, and as such appoints them to damnation and according to the superlapsarian, it finds and leaves men unfallen, but appoints no man to damnation but for sin. Yet both agree that sin, either actual or imputed, is the foundational cause of the decree, which can only be the will of God, but of damnation the thing decreed. It might with much more propriety be said that the imputation of Adam's sin is founded on that decree, than that the decree is founded upon the imputation. Hence, it follows that whereas either the decree of election or the decree of reprobation are founded upon the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity, they neither stand nor fall by it. Moreover, though the sin of Adam is imputed to his posterity, yet not merely by the arbitrary will of God. It is true it is the will of God that it should be imputed to them, but then it is imputed to them not in a way of mere pleasure, but in a way of justice. For, if all sinned in him, it is but just that judgment should come upon all men to condemnation. If it was a sin of our nature, and all human nature was corrupted and defiled with it, it is but a righteous thing that the guilt of it should be charged upon them. The several things which are proposed for the strengthening of this argument and objected to the doctrine of the imputation of Adam's sin to his posterity have been replied in the second part of this performance.
to which I refer the reader. Argument 3. This decree is false, both in the part and the end of it. The parts of it are that God hath from all eternity elected a certain number of persons to salvation, and in order to the accomplishment of it, he has decreed to offer them that grace which shall infallibly and infrustrably bring them to it, and that he hath left the rest under an absolute decree of reprobation or preterition, infallibly to fail of eternal life, of which there can be no other cause but God's own free will. For predestination, being an imminent act, cannot be dependent upon any foreseeable acts in man's will. The end is the manifestation of his grace and mercy in the salvation of the one and of his justice and sovereignty in the damnation of the other. Now, one, it is said, the falsehood of these decrees touching the absolute election of some persons to salvation is sufficiently argued in the fifth discourse from God's command to all Christians to make their calling and election sure. From his exhortations and cautions directed to them and from the threats denounced against them. But how these things militate against an absolute election of some persons to salvation is not easily to discern, since the command, as it is called, to make your election sure supposes an election of some, or it could not be made sure. And the making of it sure respects not the thing itself, but the evidence of it to others by an agreeable conversation. Besides, it is given, not to all men, but to Christians, and admitting it respects all Christians, for though all that bear that name are not really and truly so, yet inasmuch as they are, and whilst they are under the profession in a judgment of charity, they are to be esteemed the elect of God, and may be exhorted in this manner. But then all Christians are not all men, and all men are not all Christians, in the largest and most extensive sense. Wherefore, this hinders not but that there may be an absolute election of some person to eternal salvation. And as for the exhortation to continuance in the faith, cautions about falling away, and threats against such that withdraw back, unless it can be proved from hence that any good Christian, who have been really and truly so, any true believers have totally and finally fallen away. The doctrine of absolute particular election cannot be disproved by them. In the first part of this performance, I have given the sense of the passages referred to, answered the objections taken from them, and have shown that they are so far from meditating against the saints' final perseverance that they are designed and used by the Spirit of God as the means of it, and therefore cannot contradict the choice of some persons to eternal life. Two, it is further observed that these decrees are supposed to lie under an absolute decree of reprobation. The falsehood of them hath been fully proved in the second discourse, from God's serious and earnest intentions of them to repentance, from his vehement desire of their reformation and obedience, from his declarations that he had done for them what was sufficient to produce it, from his promises to excite them to it, from his threats to deter them from the evil ways, and from the manifold declarations afforded in Scripture that he doth not look upon the wicked, even men, as under any disability of being reformed by his judgments or mercies, or of hearkening to his calls and invitations to return and live. One, I reply, that these calls, desires, declarations, promises and threats do not respect all men, only the people of Israel, and not their spiritual and eternal, only their civil welfare, as a body politic, and could they be thought to all mankind, even so much whom are not eventually saved, would not disprove the decree of reprobation, since they only regard external repentance and outward reformation and obedience, which we readily owe. Wicked men may be capable of by the judgments or mercies of God, and which are not only agreeable to God, but are for their good, even for the good of reprobates, that their punishment may be milder. 3. It is argued that such a decree as this, being a secret of God's counsel, no man can know that God has made it, but from the express and clear revelation of the Holy Scriptures. 
and so no person can have any reason to assert it on any other account. Now the scripture hath said nothing of the decree of election, and that it is absolute, and without respect to man's faith, repentance or perseverance. Nor has it one syllable to prove that the object of this election is a certain number of singular persons, or that God hath absolutely ordained one single person to faith, repentance and perseverance. For the end, I answer, that the decree of election is a secret of God's counsel, and that no man can know that God hath made it, but from the revelation of the Holy Scriptures, and so can have no reason to assert it on any other account, is readily granted, and we desire to bring it to no other test or standard, being well asserted that the Scripture has said a great deal concerning it, and we are willing that it should be tried by it, whether election is conditional or absolute, respective or irrespective of man's faith, repentance and perseverance, whether it has for its objects churches and nations or a certain number of singular persons, I have shown in the second part of this work that the scriptures often speak of this decree and that as absolute and unconditional and as a certain number of persons whom the Lord knows to be his, who are the little flock, the sheep of Christ, the Father hath given to him, not as Judas was to be his apostle, but to be saved by him, with an everlasting salvation. When we say that this decree is irrespective of faith or holiness or perseverance in grace, we do not mean that God in this decree has no respect to these things. For we know that whom he hath chosen, they are chosen by him through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. And that God saves none and has determined to save none of riper years, but such who believe and persevere to the end, so that this decree perfectly agrees with the express declaration of Scripture in Mark 16, verse 16, and others of the like kind. But we say and mean that God in his decree did not consider these things to be performed by the will of man, and as motives inducing him to make such a decree, but what he determined to bestow upon them as means to salvation. And as far as God's ordaining single person to faith, repentance and perseverance, to the end we say with the scriptures that men are ordained to eternal life, which cannot be understood of churches or nations, but of singular persons, and that he has determined to give them grace to repent, believe and persevere to the end, that they might enjoy that eternal life which he has ordained them to. Or, but it is objective that to say that election or predestination being an imminent internal act of God's understanding or rather of his will can have no dependence on or respect to any act of man's will by way of motion or condition is to say things contrary to scripture and to common sense. For did not God decree from all eternity to pardon the penitent, justify him that believes in Jesus, save the obedient, glorify them that suffer for Christ, judge all men according to their works, offer to man a new covenant of grace, promising pardon and salvation to him upon condition of his faith, repentance and a sincere obedience, and that he that believeth in his Son should have everlasting life. And must not these imminent eternal acts have respect to the temporal acts of men? I answer that since election or predestination is an imminent act of God, it must be within himself, and therefore nothing without himself can be the cause of the condition of it, or motive to it. And seeing it is an eternal one, not anything done in time can have any influence upon it. And inasmuch as it is an act of his will, rather than of his understanding, it cannot depend upon or be moved by any act of man's will without making the will of God dependent upon the will of the creature, and the first mover of it. It is true indeed that God did from all eternity decree to pardon the penitent, justify the believer, save the obedient, glorify such who suffer for Christ, judge men according to their works, and did from all eternity really make a covenant of grace with Christ on their behalf of the elect, but did not decree to offer to man a new covenant of grace, nor make one promising pardon and salvation to them upon condition of their faith, repentance 
and sincere obedience, but upon condition of the perfect obedience and sufferings of Christ, and has also declared in the Gospel that he that believes on the Son shall have eternal life. But then, as repentance is not the cause of pardon, nor faith of justification, nor obedience of salvation, nor sufferings for and with Christ for glorification, so, when God from all eternity did decree to pardon, justify, save and glorify, these persons he had no respect to these things by way of motive or condition. He did not decree to pardon, justify, save and glorify upon a foresight of these things as arising from the will of man. But, having resolved to pardon, justify, save and glorify these men, he determined to give them of his own will and pleasure the grace by which they should become penitent believers, obedient and cheerful sufferers for and with Christ. For that faith, repentance, obedience and light cannot be considered as conditions of or motives to the decrees of God, since they spring from the grace of God in these decrees of his, as determined to bestow upon the persons he bears such a good will unto. If sin, as is suggested, is the inducement of God from all eternity to decree to cast some men out of his favour, it must have been an inducement to cast all men out of his favour, since all have sinned, and are equally unworthy of it. And if those actions, wrought by the assistance of his grace, in some, are inducements to him to decree to reward them with eternal life, how comes it to pass that such actions are not wrought by the assistance of his grace in all men? It remains that nothing can be the cause of these imminent and eternal decrees of God but his own will and pleasure. 5. Whereas we say that God's ultimate end in these decrees is his own glory, the manifestation of the glory of his grace and mercy together with his justice by the one and the manifestation of the glory of his vindictive wrath and justice by the other, our author takes some pains to show that the end for which he decrees anything concerning us is not and cannot be any advantage or good he expects to reap from it. He being from all eternity past as completely happy as he can be to eternity to come and therefore what other end he asks can he be supposed to aim at in these things but our good. I reply that it will be freely owned that God is completely happy nor can anything in time or to eternity add to that happiness and glory. Yet his great design in all his ways and works is the manifestation of his glory to his creatures. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory for ever. Amen. Which may be concluded without entertaining such vain imaginations and conceits as if his view was to gain esteem or a good word from such wild creatures as we or as if he was concerned whether we approve or disapprove of his proceedings, or as if he can be tickled with applause and aim at reputation from us in his glorious design. Moreover, though the good of the elect, even their eternal salvation, is a subordinate end to the degree of election, yet what good can be designed for the reprobates in the decree of reprobation? even according to our author's own scheme of it. It is not easy to discern, for he says, He, that is God, from his justice, hath decreed from all eternity to cast some men out of his favour. The inducement to it is that sin which hath rendered them unworthy of it, and rendered it inconsistent with his holiness and justice to admit them into it. But it is certain from the scriptures which only can give us an account of these decrees, that God's design in the one is the decoration of his wrath and justice, and in the other of his grace and mercy. For not to take notice of Proverbs 16 verse 4, the sense of which passage and the argument upon it has been vindicated in the second part of this work. The scripture says unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout the whole earth. 
and a little after, what if willing to show his wrath and make his power known, endure with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his grace on the vessels of mercy afore prepared unto glory. Add to this that well-known place of Scripture hath predestined us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. This writer suggests that if it is for the glory of his grace decreed to save some, it must be more for the glory of it to decree to save more, and most of all to decree to save all, and to prepare saving grace for all, and not restrain it to a few. To which I reply, that had God decreed to save all men, and had prepared saving grace for all men, then all men would be saved. What should hinder? But I do not find that the opposite scheme provides for this any more than ours, and therefore no more magnifies the glory of God's grace and mercy than ours does, if so much, since it provides not for the certainty, but an uncertain precarious salvation. Besides, if God had decreed to save all men, and had prepared saving grace for all men, here would be indeed, here would indeed have been the display of the glory of his grace and mercy, but where would have been the decoration of his wrath and justice, especially of the glory of God's sovereignty, more appears by those distinct decrees. No such distinction had been made. For hence it is evident that he will have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. 6. The other black part of this decree is said to be still more horrible, immediate consequences, for it makes God to create innumerable souls after the fall of Adam to be inevitably damned without the least compassion for them or will to afford them means sufficient to exempt them from that dreadful doom and in prosecution of that end, this end, having created them pure and instant it makes him to put them into bodies that so they may be made or deemed the offspring of Adam and by being so may be made the fit objects of eternal wrath. I answer that innumerable souls are made since the fall of Adam and are put into or united to human bodies are things generally agreed upon but how these souls are united to human bodies and how they become polluted with sin, and so fit objects of God's wrath, and indeed, whether they are by immediate creation or extra use, or both, cannot be so easily determined. However, that God created souls to be inevitably damned, and put them in bodies that they might be fit objects of eternal wrath, are things we abhor and detest, and are no consequences of, nor can they be fairly deduced from the decree of reprobation which, whether it considers creatures fallen or unfallen, leaves them as he finds them, or puts nothing in them, nor is creation the means of damnation, nor damnation the ends of creation. God made no man to damn him, but he made him for himself and for his own glory. To conclude, this author himself owns a decree of God from all eternity to cast some men out of his favour, induced to it by sin, and another decree to reward some of them with eternal life or the enjoyment of himself induced to it by those actions wrought in them by the assistance of his grace. And according to this scheme, salvation and damnation are inevitable as they are according to ours. Since God's full knowledge of sin and damnation of grace and salvation is infallible as his decree to damn or to save, and the absurdities which are supposed to follow upon our scheme must follow upon this. For God foresaw that these men would sin and continue in it, whereby he would be induced to say, on the account of which he decreed to cast them out of his favour. And yet he creates them, permits them to sin, when he could have hindered it. And to many of them he does not give the outward means of grace, and none of them the assistance of his grace, by which these actions are performed, which induce him to reward others with eternal life, 
when it is equally in his power to assist them as others and in a word denies them that grace which would cure them of their impenitence and unbelief as it does to others to whom it is given but suffers them to continue in sin when he could have restrained them from it and deliver them from it the consequence of which is their everlasting ruin and destruction 